had one of my viewers bring me one of those little Citizen AM FM TVs, a little five inch black and white TV with an AM FM radio. This one's red in color, vintage. It's dead. And he wanted to see if I could uh, get the thing working and give him a video input so that he could use it with external video as there's no more analog TV anyway. So let's see what we can come up with on this little unit. I got this little AM FM Citizen black and white five inch TV with a radio in and the guy that owns this thing, he said he would like to, well, first of all, it doesn't work. He bought it at a thrift shop, I believe. But he'd like to see if I can get this thing to work and if I can get it to work, provide him with a, a video input so that he can use it with a, uh, with an AV, like a AV source, such as an HDMI adapter. the screws have already been removed for me that makes it convenient uh, apparently it doesn't work so I'm going to uh, see if I can get this thing to operate operates off AC power and off of 12 volts so let's take the top off this thing first which should be relatively easy because I believe the screws have already been removed so let's get this thing apart and see if I can get this to operate Lift the bottom off. This is kind of a different design. Circuit board lifts out on the bottom here. Power supply and the tube is in the top part of the cabinet. Let's uh, give it power and see what happens. Okay, the only thing I hear when I turn on the power is I hear a power supply humming. I hear the hum of the transformer. I don't hear any sound from the radio or the TV. And in radio mode, we should have noise because the radio and TV are completely separate. This is the TV board, the radio board is the other one. We know that uh, it's probably something that's common to both. And what is common to both? That would be the power supply. So that's what we're going to check out. Now on the power supply, at the back here, this is the, there's a black, brown, and red wire bundle that's leaving the power supply. And that's going to be the DC power that goes up to the board. And it actually goes up to this connector up here, connector number one. You can see it right there. There's the, there's the power wire. So therefore, when I apply power, and the power's off by the way, but when I apply power to this thing, I should have power on probably the black and the red wire. Uh, let's see which one's which on this. I think it goes black, red, brown. So the ground is gonna be here, and the next one over to it is gonna be the power line. Let's get the meter going and see whether we get any power on CN1, which is the one going to the main power switch. As you can see, here's the power switch here. So we should have power right now, and we don't. Therefore, we know the problem with this is most likely in the power supply, because we're not getting our 12 volts. Now what could cause a problem on a power supply? Well, it could be the transformer, unlikely. We can hear it humming. But there's a bridge rectifier in here, and there's also switching for when the unit has got, to, whether it's got batteries in it or AC power. And sometimes, you know what? If you put the wrong power cord in, like I may have, we're not gonna activate that switch, which is to switch from battery power to AC power. So it could be something as simple for as far as getting power is not plugging in the right cord. This one uses a polarized cord. Let me see if I can find one of those polarized cords well, I know I've got one. It's the same cord that Sony uses. I can steal one off my Sony TV. That is a bit bigger cord. I don't even know if that's the right one. We'll see if this one will... Uh, this one may not activate the switch either, but we'll try it and see. So do we have power? We still have no power. So to get this face off here to get at the circuit board, I gotta remove the radio and the main board. 
And now the front with the tube will lift off. What a nightmare. That's just to get enough clearance so I can get into the power supply to see if the power supply is working. Even back then, these things were not designed for easy service. But now that the now that the tube is separated, I can remove that so it doesn't get damaged. And uh, I can now at least get into the power supply. Somebody's already tried to be into this because the screw is mostly out. But we can get into the power supply here and see why it's not putting out power. There's a couple fuses, so it could even be a blown fuse on the power board. But here's the, the rectifier board. For that matter, that switch, I'm sure there's a switch on this. I can bypass that so that it's always going to run on AC. There is a switch. As you can see, it's right here. You can see that, that there's a leaf switch there that changes from battery to AC. So if we want to run on AC, we just have to bridge those two together and then it'll be AC. And there's a fuse for AC. We'll check that fuse. Looks like the fuse might be popped. Okay, that switch, when that is pushed, that switch should connect to power on this. And the switch is now connecting to DC. Okay, but that fuse is blown. That would explain right there why nothing's working. We've got a blown DC fuse. When I plug this power in, I'll turn off the power here. When I plug this in, will it activate the switch? Let's see. Maybe it will. Yeah, okay, so the switch is being activated because it was on the DC side before. Now it's on the AC side. And now it's back to the DC side. So let's let's pop this fuse out and see what I've got to replace it with. It looks like a one amp fuse. Should be able to find a one amp fuse around here that I can put in place of this one. The soldered in fuse called a pigtail fuse. So let me just take the old one out. We'll find a new one. Now quite often these fuses will blow for a reason so it's very possible that when I put a new fuse in it's going to blow because there might be a fault somewhere else in the unit which I hope it doesn't have but let me go and find a replacement fuse for that. It doesn't look to be it's not like it's blown all to smithereens, so it may have just been a stress failure. Okay, I got a new fuse in there. Uh, I'm just going to check the diode to make sure there's no, no diodes that are shorted on this thing. Diodes are okay. Um, I'm sure someone's going to suggest that a fuse doesn't blow without a reason. Uh, fuses do blow without reason lots of times. Um, it could have been a reason. It could be something shorted on here that we don't know about yet. So there could be a, a, a bad transistor or bad regulator. Something could have shorted on here. It also could have been something as simple as some uh, moron plugging it into a DC 12 volt plug with a center tip positive when this requires a center tip negative. This is a positive ground. So it could have been someone trying a DC cord with the wrong polarity and that would pop the fuse too. So um, fuse blowing, ah, it's not too critical. Um, it happens. It's a pain in the butt to change, so I've got the new fuse in. We'll put the uh, we'll put the picture tube back into place here if we can, just to protect it. Snap this back together. I hate these designs. I really do. And they're very difficult to uh, get them apart to begin with, and then you got to snap them back together. But uh, I just want some sort of protection here to the tube. And with it, with the chassis not snapped together, there is a little protection for the tube itself. So let's just put this chassis back together. It snaps in like that. Okay, I think that's got 
Well, not quite. We'll deal with this more later, but I just want to kind of get this thing protected so that I can power it up and see if anything works. Okay, I got the chassis reconnected here. Got the power not on yet, but I got the power applied. Power cord applied. I got the radio is not in place yet or anything. I just kind of set everything down here. Uh, let's put it on. Let's put it into radio position and uh, make sure the volume's not cranked all the way and see if we get any sound when I power it up. Ah, good sound. Good, good first start there. We have power. Let's turn on the TV portion and see whether we get anything out of the TV. And, ta-da, I have a raster. I have a raster. Good stuff. If I um, connect up my antenna, wherever the heck that goes, uh, I'll get a picture. So he's giving me an antenna adapter to screw into coax. I just so happen that I have analog TV here. So we'll put the little analog adapter on and uh, proceed to plug it into the antenna, which is located on this side of the set. So I'm just going to power it off so that I don't get a shock while I'm doing this. So I have to kind of manipulate the board out of the way here. Okay, I've now got an antenna connected. And the uh, tuner is up on the set here. First of all, actually, what I'm going to do first before I even go that far is I know that the set works. At this point, let's just remount the, the, the radio board and the volume control because we know that that part's probably going to be fine. So let me just do that. Oh, what a terrible design this thing is. You know, it's like, yeah, just to do anything on this set is uh, like pulling teeth. Unplug the volume control there so I can reattach the volume control. I didn't need to take that out, I just didn't know that. So let me get the volume control reattached. Okay, volume control is reattached. I'll now take the radio board and we'll put the radio circuit board back in place. See, this all has to, this is, this all had to come out to release that front cabinet. A silly, silly design. And a screw that's still stuck in here, that's what's stopping, preventing it from going into place. That's got that in place. I think there's one more screw, maybe not. Put the AM FM selector knob on now. However the heck that goes in. That goes on here. that good old volume knob and then the two uh, tuning knobs that go on the top the radio and the 
TV tuning dial. Okay, now I should be able to connect this thing up to an antenna. But well, once I plug the plugs back in to uh, connect up the controls, I should be able to plug this thing into an antenna and uh, or my cable system and uh, get a picture. Hopefully, hopefully I'll get a picture. External antenna goes here on this side over here to that, that plug right there. Yeah, he was in a mental institution and that was because he said that he had so much guilt from the, the horrific crime itself. Uh, so I was positive, absolutely positive that he had at least one of the suspects. And McGraw gave police the names of his It works. I have an analog uh, the others uh, TV system here so I can so I can get uh, pictures and sound on analog for testing TVs and stuff and this one seems to be working so here's the the, the VHF high band I get like I can get low band Low band I've got. Some scene replaying with music. That's coming off of YouTube. Or off the internet. And music coming off an MP3 player. I've also got uh, CNN for hours. on there. Nunez was the high band I've got. Channel 12, which is my in-house concert player. Keiko Mitsui that's playing there. My security cameras are on channel 9 and some other videos playing on channel 7. So those are my in-house channels. Yeah, it looks good. Nice sharp picture. I don't need to do anything to this. Uh, this TV is working great. Just a blown fuse. Go to the uh, radio side of things. Sounds like it's working. Uh, AM is a Radio's working and the TV's working. Good evening, thank you for joining us. It's Wednesday, October 28th. I'm Yasmin Gandam. And I'm Jonathan Secris. We're at 11 degrees downtown here. Back to TV. Takes a second for the TV to warm up. And there's my security cameras again. Um, so this one's pretty much done. I think the client wants or want, may want me to put a video input on it. So we'll investigate where the video uh, detector is on this so that I can investigate um, finding a point and putting a jack on it for uh, in video input. So I see 101 is going to be the, uh, the, the IF on this unit. So video is going to be on one of these pins. It's easy to find out. We just have to go through here with the scope and find out which one's got video. Uh, I've got video right there. Right there is video. If I show you guys the scope. Video. That's for my cameras. So if I disconnect that pin, one side will be an input and one side will be an output. So let's just, let's just uh, unsolder that pin. It's this one right there. TV is off now.
That should be disconnected enough. Should be open now. Open. We'll look and see. I think that's an that's a output, so this should be the video input into the amplifier here, into the uh, video circuit. Should be that one. If I scope the pin coming off the IC, I have video and I have nothing going into the set, as you'll see. So here's the pin itself. There's the video from the tuner and here's the land. So if I connect a video source to that land, I have now converted this TV into a video monitor. So all I need to do is just connect that capacitor to isolate the input. We'll connect it to the land here. It goes into the circuit from the IC. And we'll connect up a couple of leads to it. I'll connect ground and video in. Turn this thing around. And I'm going to connect the other end of that uh, to a cable, which is going to my color bar generating camera. And when I apply power, we should see black and white color bars on the screen. Power. And there we have black and white color bars. That's how simple it is to put a video input into one of these little TVs. So I was talking to the customer that owns this and he wants to use this thing as a computer monitor. So he's never gonna use it for RF. He doesn't want to display video. He's just gonna use it to display some computer data on. So we're gonna put a permanent uh, video input and leave it as a permanent video input. I'm gonna take it off of, of C118, which is the capacitor, which is directly connected to the video output. So I'm just gonna tap or tag <laughs> tack my cap on I'm just using a, a 47 microfarad uh, electrolytic here just to provide me with the with isolation so that there's no chance of any DC voltage from the set itself making its way back into the video input of whatever device is feeding it so it's just being used to block any DC that may or may not be present so all I need to do is just basically solder this down. I've already disconnected the, um, the detector. So I'm just going to go in on this side and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, tack, we'll, we'll tack onto it right here, right on this little ceramic cap. I'm just gonna, and I'm just going to put a uh, an RCA cable on here. We'll put it into the battery compartment because he's going to put a he's going to put an, um, a HDMI to a video adapter and fit it inside the battery compartment. Get some more light in here so I can see what I'm doing. Okay, I'm just going to connect a, a, an RCA line. I'm actually going to give him quite a long wire. That way, if he doesn't have room in the battery compartment to mount the, um, the HDMI to AV adapter, you can just run the cord out and mount it in the back and plug it in, right? And I think he was wanting to put, an H, put the whole HDMI cable right into the back of the set. I don't know if there's going to be enough room in here to do it, but... Um, even so, even though you just tie up the excess wire, I'm just going to give them extra wire because I just happen to have one that's about I don't know, about ten feet long, probably. So um, I'll just use that. We'll put some heat shrink 
tubing around it and ground it to the tuner. That way we don't have to worry about it shorting out against anything. Bring the heat shrink tubing down like that. We'll heat shrink that around that capacitor and then ground the uh, the shield over to the tuner and that should complete this modification so that this little TV can live out the rest of its life as a computer monitor. And then we just have to solder that on. Either one of them is ground, right? Doesn't matter. Either one of these is a ground connection. Okay, let's turn on the power. There we have perfect black and white. Actually, it's got very good, it's got very good grayscale. This tube is in really good shape. But there we have perfect monochrome. That black bar is my, that's the high speed shutter on my camera. Um, yeah, perfect black and white bars. So this one's ready to go and uh, there you go, that's how you mod one of these little TVs for video input. The radio should still work. So he's got a radio and he's got a video monitor. Let's put this one back together. And there it is. It's back together. Brightness and contrast controls work. All the controls work on it. And it's now a dedicated video monitor. And the radio Things was completed back in 1903. Still works. Yeah, it'll buzz when this uh, turn to video because it, the uh, audio circuit's not disconnected. I left it like that so that the radio still works. But there it is, video monitor. A complete little Citizen Samsung, a little red Citizen. That's actually kind of cool. Uh, modified now for uh, dedicated video input. And uh, it's going back to the, the, the owner of it. He's going to use it on his desk as a secondary monitor for his computer. So uh, there you go. It's looking good. Thanks for watching, and uh, we'll catch you again in the next one. And I'll show you what I did for the for the uh, audio or for the video cord. I just brought out the back of the uh, battery cover. That way, any excess line, if you you know, you can coil it up inside there. For that matter, you could probably put the HDMI adapter inside there and cut a bigger hole in the back to put the HDMI cable. But I wouldn't do that myself. I would just uh, put what he doesn't need inside here. You can shove the rest of it in plug the end of the, the cable into the video out from an HDMI adapter and uh, he's good to go and I left them with a good length of cable so that uh, if that if that adapter is located further away like at the back of his computer for example you just got one cord running down and power 
There you go. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you again in the next one real soon. Bye for now.